shall we start this now? call is now being recorded good afternoon ma'am shall we start now ma'am am i audible ma'am good afternoon ma'am ஆனாலுக்கான Let me introduce the resource person of today's session, Dr. Rupali Ahtiwalia. She is the head of the Department of Commerce, St. Aloysius College, Jabalpur, Madhya Pradesh. She has teaching and administrative experience of 17 years. She has completed post-doctoral fellowship from ICSSR and doctoral studies in international trade relations. Dr. Rupali is the recipient of two gold medals from former President APJ Kalam for her outstanding performance in post-graduation. her areas of expertise include research methodology in social science naac assessment and accreditation and quality initiatives in higher education she has completed two research projects authored two books published chapters in books and research papers in various national and international journals she also holds membership in various administrative committees with this i hand over the session to dr rupali ma'am please uh, thank you very much ma'am for those fine words and uh, welcome to all of, of you who have joined us today uh, this two day uh, fdp that uh, the iot academy has uh, initiated is actually directed towards understanding outcome based teaching so uh, in the two days that you know you will be dealing with uh, various uh, cognitive levels or various frameworks which help us to understand what education is and how we can make education more outcome based so this is going to be the general uh, overview that we are uh, going to look to achieve and uh, we hope that uh, in the two days uh, today i will be taking a session tomorrow there will be somebody else who will be taking the session but we will be on the same uh, team so let us see how far we are able to accomplish and in our teaching we are able to implement the so called outcome based method methodology of uh, teaching and learning so uh, let me share my slides with you and in the meantime i would also like to do a check if you know if i speak in english everybody is comfortable or you want me to speak in hindi as well as english so that will help me to understand you know how best we can communicate so everybody is okay if we are only you know communicating in english during the session uh in english ma okay only english okay okay thank you and uh, like last time also i had uh, mentioned that you know during a session particularly an online session if there is only one way input it becomes really very very monotonous and what happens very very often is that you know only the computer is listening and you know that does not solve the purpose very much so i would uh, very humbly request all the participants while we are you know into the session if you can add your valuable inputs your valuable comments whatever your observations are it will be very very helpful for us to make the session very very meaningful because you know that uh, is like a fuel uh, for the entire session if there is only one person who is doing all the talking then uh, very uh, likely that we will not be able to achieve the said objective or the understanding that we are trying to make so it is a very very humble request that Uh, you are more than free to communicate share your insights and inputs as we move on to the session uh, 
primarily during my session, my focus today will be on blooms uh, and uh, how uh, this very, very beautiful framework of blooms has been used very less. It is an undermined framework. It has a lot of potential, but then that potential has not been used. That is what we are going to look at. So our primary focus uh, in the next one hour is going to be on understanding and exploring blooms at various dimensions. So this is what you know we will look to achieve. That will be the first target. If that happens well, then we will move to you know what adult learning principles are all about, and then finally we will conclude with uh, UDL, which is a very very upcoming principle of outcome based teaching and learning. So these are primarily the three objectives, if I reiterate, blooms, exploring it in all dimensions, adult learning principles, and then UDL, universal design of learning, is what we look to, you know, go through in the next one and a half hour, and I, one hour rather, not one and a half hour, so to spare you, one hour, and uh, uh, during uh, the session, if you have your valuable inputs, I will be more than happy to take them. So uh, let us begin. Is uh, the PPT visible? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Just a Okay, so here is where I come from. I come from uh, Central Oasis College, which is in Jabalpur in Madhya Pradesh. And uh, I have been working in the Department of Commerce and we are an autonomous college. So here is a little bit about my background. And as we proceed further, even in the last you know session that I took, uh, I had you know this one, um, word which I normally ask the participants to uh, respond on. So if you have your insights on how you understand education, I will be very happy to take your responses. When you see this word education, what is that one sentence or that one line or so to say your definition of education? If uh, ma'am, I hope the participants can unmute and uh, speak. Is that uh, privilege allowed? Yes, ma'am, I have an Okay, thank you. So what is so that one sentence that comes into your mind when you look at this word education? Any one of you? They will be answering in chat box also. Achha, uh, are they able to speak or I'll have to go to the chat box? They'll be able to speak, ma'am. Okay. So any responses, anybody who would like to add to what they understand or what? Yes, somebody has unmuted. Evaluation. Ma'am, please may I know your name? Linda. And ma'am, you come from where? From CSA Event Women's Christian College, Chennai, ma'am. Okay, from Chennai. So education is basically evaluation. Uh, ma'am, Linda from Chennai has very, very precisely said that education is evaluation. Thank you for your contribution. Uh, anybody else would like to add? Anybody else? Improving knowledge. Uh, sir, please may I know your uh, details, your name? Uh, Rajesh. Okay, Rajesh, sir, you come from which institution? American College, Madurai. American College, Madurai. Oh, that's great. I have been to American College, Madurai. I have I've had the pleasure of uh, visiting the college. Oh, Some thank you, ma'am. You are always welcome. Yeah, I, I I came there in 2012, long time back. Okay. Uh, and I just, uh, you know, had a round of the college. That's all. I did not interact with anybody there because I was on a stay, you know, due to family reasons in Madurai for two years. So that was close to my house. So out of curiosity, I just went to college. Okay, you are from Tamil Nadu? Or? No, I'm from Madhya Pradesh. I just 
happened to be in Madurai. Uh, oh, great. Yes. You are always welcome to American College, madam. Yes, in definitely. Future. Now I will take your acquaintance and whenever I come there, I'll, I'll definitely try and meet you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Rajesh. So uh, his insight is improving knowledge is what education is. So thank you so much. And one last response if we can have, we will proceed. Anybody else? One more person? Okay. Anyway, we proceed uh, further. Why I was taking responses is since I told you at the outset that today we will be exploring humans in all its uh, in all the dimensions that we can. It is very very important to have that simplified understanding of what education is because Bloom's is actually an educational taxonomy, and once our understanding of education is simple, Bloom's look to be looks to be very very simple. I have come across participants in various sessions who have barely heard what Bloom's is, but they have no understanding of what it is all about. So the first step of really mastering Bloom's is to simplify your understanding of education. So, uh, you know, uh, Ma'am Lintha from Chennai said education is evaluation. Uh, then uh, uh, Professor or Dr. Rajesh from American College uh, said that education is improving knowledge. And I would just like to add to these two valuable insights that we have that can we just simplify and say that education is nothing but just learning. If I don't know how to drive a, a bicycle and if I, you know, and if I am able to, that means I'm learning to ride a bicycle that comes, you know, that very well comes in uh, education, the framework of education. If I do not know how to cook, and if I can learn two or three, say, South Indian dishes, since I come from Northern India, if I can learn two or three dishes from Southern India, that means that is education. I'm learning something that I do not know. So it is very, very important to be able to master blooms is to have a simplified or a very, very simple meaning, a simple meaning of education. And education is just learning. What sadly has happened is that since we are all bound by frameworks of, you know, degrees and colleges and institutions, we say that only when there is a certification, we say a person is educated. For that matter, if we go back, you know, our uh, ancestors or forefathers knew much more uh, than wh what an educated individual who comes out of the college right now knows. That is simply because we have connected education merely with degrees or certifications that has to really, you know, uh, be revamped or we need to realign that understanding and say that education is simply learning. So I hope that, you know, uh, with this very, very simple understanding of education, uh, I would uh, just like to bring to your notice then if education is just learning, then as educators or as you know, people who are associated with education. Do we not say that education is not about molding the learner the way you think they should be? It is just organizing their natural longing to learn. Now, uh, this is a second. Children in the age group of say one to say 10 years. We often find that they are so enthusiastic. They want to know everything. You know, they want to know why this is happening, what is this, how this can be done. They have so many things that they want to know. This is a clear cut indication that everybody has a natural longing to learn. Just like we feel thirsty, we need water. We feel hungry, we need food. Similarly, we have that natural longing to learn and we need education. So it is something very, very natural. And somewhere, this is the second link that we have missed. Second link that we have missed is that we have made education something very, very specific in terms of degrees, in terms of certification. And that natural longing to learn has certainly, you know, uh, fizzled away, it has vanished. And now we find that we have to make all the efforts to make those students come to class, make those students do what we want them to do and make those students to learn and attempt the exams that we want them to pass a degree. 
So this is the second, uh, you know, background that we need to set before we arrive at dreams. <laughs> Moving further. So if we say that education is something, you know, which is natural, we all have a natural longing to learn. That means it is a natural trait. Just like we feel hungry, we feel thirsty, we need that, you know, the, the desire to know is also something very, very natural. And if something is natural, then it should be something very joyful. You know, there should be no stress. There should not be that force element. We should not see that students, you know, or the teachers make all the efforts to see that the students come to class, they are there, their attention is there. So somewhere, if we say that it is a natural process, as teachers, we need to guide them. We need to provide them with those aids and we need to help them. And take the role of the facilitator more than the controlling teacher who tries to say that this is the way my class should function. This is the way the students in my subject should learn. And this is the way how they should perform. So we need to somewhere go beyond this understanding or this framework of saying that my students will be successful only if they do things the way I tell them to do or only if they perform in ways that I think are good or not so good. So this is an entire philosophy we need, we need to revisit or we need to realign to be able to understand Bloom's first and then to be able to apply Bloom's in our day-to-day -day teaching. So let us go back on uh, you know, what we have discussed in the last 15 minutes. We have discussed that educational understanding of education needs to be very, very simple. You need to tell your students that if they are coming to your classroom with something that they did not know yesterday, they are definitely, you know, moving ahead in the process of education. Secondly, we need to understand that the longing to learn is very, very natural. And as teachers, we need to facilitate this natural instinct so that our students are able to move up that level of understanding that we are going to discuss in Blooms. And that becomes a process which is natural and so joyful. So if you feel thirsty and you get a glass of water, there is a sense of joy. When you are hungry, when you get food, there is a sense of joy. Similarly, when your students are looking to learn something and you as facilitators are able to teach them something, there should be a feeling of joy. If that joy is not happening, that means what we are giving them is not what is required. We are giving them what we want to give them. So that is the difference that we need to understand and you know, uh, be able to uh, use blooms effectively in our daily classroom. So with this understanding, let us now jump to blooms, which again becomes a very, very theoretical framework. So uh, how many of our participants have, uh, you know, an understanding of blooms before, you know, we discuss? If one or two of you can just tell me, has anybody read blooms or you have an understanding of what blooms is or how it is applied? Anybody? Uh, nobody has ever, uh, under, uh, you know, heard of blooms. I, I believe you must have heard of blooms. That's not the right question. Have you uh, had the you know opportunity to uh, understand what blooms is before this session? That's a simple yes or no. Uh, you know there is no rocket science in what I'm asking. Uh, no, uh, nobody has heard of what blooms is. Am I audible in the first place? Yes, ma'am. I'm audible. Okay. So just going back, uh, nobody has heard blooms before this. So that means that nobody has heard blooms. If there is so much of silence, uh, uh, Esther, ma'am, is saying yes, she has heard. Then uh, uh, Rajesh sir is saying yes, but little. Then uh, do I don't think you know they have the privilege. I, I'm sure they have the privilege. Uh, and uh, again, um, Kartik is, is saying yes, we have heard. So okay, thank you for those responses. Uh, 
so some understanding is there of loom so let us now uh, move back to what you know looms is all about uh, an in-depth understanding of looms and then we will try and see how this framework which is more theoretical up till now can be used in your classrooms to travel that distance uh, you know that we seek to travel so basically blooms is a framework uh, or so to say framework which is defining the different levels of understanding are you able to see what I'm writing? No, we can understand. So basically, a very, very simplistic uh, overview of Bloom's is that Bloom's is a framework which tells you the different levels of understanding while you are in your class. So it is very, very important as teachers that we are able to understand what is the level of Bloom's that we are hitting when we are in class. So very often, Supposing, uh, you know, you are, say, a, a teacher who is teaching physics. So before you uh, go to class, it is very important for you to understand which level of humans are you going to address when you go to class today. It could be simply knowledge where you tell them, you know, what is, uh, say, uh, the law of thermodynamics. I'm from commerce, by the way. So uh, please don't expect that I will be you know, very, very fluent with all these terms. But to, to be multidisciplinary, I'm just taking an example from physics. So supposing uh, you, you, know, you are dealing with a topic of, say, law of thermodynamics. This law of thermodynamics will have to be unfolded in your classroom in very, very different ways. You may require, say, 10 lectures to be able to deliver what your syllabus wants. But in those 10 lectures, Certainly, you need to make sure as teachers that you do not stagnate to only one level of blooms or maybe the second level. You need to make that conscious effort that you try and accomplish almost all or to a large extent most of the levels that blooms is offering. So that is what we are trying to you know, understand here. Uh, so Bloom's uh, in the initial level uh, focuses on imparting knowledge to your students. Typically, when we go to class, we introduce that topic that we want our students to know. We have that introductory lecture where we explain. We have a set of notes that we uh, you know share with them. And then in the next class, maybe we ask them to do something or ask them certain questions so that we can see whether you know there is comprehension your students are able to understand uh, what you taught them in the first level so uh, we as teachers by different means are trying to climb up those levels of rooms so in the first instance we tried to collect the material that we need to uh, have in terms of lectures in terms of explanation that we need to explain the law of thermodynamics in the second we tried to uh, you know, ask questions to see how far what we did in the first level was clear to our students. In the third uh, level, we try to give them some assignments where we see that are they able to apply what was taught to them. But believe me, in most classroom scenarios across the world, barring very, very few you know, top class educational institutions, this is where the story gets over. Uh, you know, uh, very, very challenging uh, uh, academicians as well are able to take their students up to the level of application. And after that, we find that, you know, uh, the analysis part, the synthesis part and the evaluation part does not happen in most of the classrooms. So basically, in the Bloom's uh, framework, these are considered to be lower order thinking skills or lots, so to say, lower order thinking skills, where you have a broad base of knowledge that you give to your students. You check upon questions to see that they are understanding or they are, there is comprehension and you give them some assignments or some tests so that you know that they are able to apply what you taught them. But very often, this path of blooms, which is referred to as POTS, higher order thinking skills is missing or as teachers we may you know 
has that argument in our favor that we do not have the time in the curriculum framework to address the higher order thinking skills of goons, which actually is analyze, synthesize, and evaluate. And if I will tell you to look at this uh, shape of Bloom's taxonomy once again, very carefully on the screen, you will also see that Bloom's has also given uh, a triangular shape to the taxonomy, indicating rightfully that there is a lot of time that is spent on knowledge, comprehension, and application. And in this pyramid, there is this narrow peak indicating very, very less time, or in fact, in practical scenarios, no time to analyze, synthesize, and evaluate in your classroom experiences. So technically speaking, Bloom's in the pyramid form that we see right now has that gap where you build on a very, very broad base of knowledge. You have comprehension and application, but then there is a very narrow peak or very less time or opportunity that you give to your students to achieve or to attempt those higher order thinking skills of analysis, synthesis, and evaluation. So this is what is the original framework of Bloom's where you have six levels of understanding, the first three being uh, lower order thinking skills and the other top three being higher order thinking skills. And since it is a pyramid itself indicating that there is a lot of space, time and opportunity in your classroom experience for those lower order skills and a very narrow peak of the pyramid indicating less time all those higher order thinking skills. So this is, you know, the 1956 framework of Bloom's that was given. Let me take you further in the journey of Bloom's. Uh, there was a certain evolution of Bloom's in 2001, which was done by Anderson and Prothwell. So Lauren Anderson and David uh, Prothwell uh, upgraded or so to say revisited Bloom's in 2001, where you see that these levels of understanding have you know, slightly changed. You see that the levels of understanding have been replaced by action verbs. So if I take you back, you know, the first level was, um, if I take you back, the first level of knowledge has become remember. The second level of comprehension has become understand application become became apply so basically in the 2001 anderson and crothwell model of blooms what has been done is that the levels of understanding have been replaced with action verbs so to say that what is it what do my students do So in the 2001 model, which is certainly an upgradation of Bloom's given by Anderson and Prothwell, you find that now we are no longer saying that I want my student to have that knowledge, that comprehension, that application. It is clearly indicating in the first level, I want that my student should remember what I am teaching. In the second level, I want that the student should be able to understand beyond just rote learning. Third level, I want them to apply. Fourth, I want them to analyze and evaluate what they have done. And it is a combination of analyzing and evaluating that my student is able to create something on the basis of what I have done uh, in the first three levels of Blooms. So Anderson and Prothwell model of Blooms of 2001 is certainly an improvement of Blooms in terms of connecting it to action verbs and clearly indicating what I want my students to do. But again, there is one Thing that we witness again, there is that narrow peak and that broad base where we have more time for lower order thinking skills and very less time for higher order thinking skills. So it is basically that pyramid that we are trying to revisit again and again to understand looms in its in its full dimension. As at the outset, I told you that we will be exploring looms in all the possible dimensions that we can. So we explored the original 1956 model where we found that there was a pyramid explaining the levels of understanding. Then in the 2001 Anderson and Prothwell model, uh, we found that again, action verbs were introduced, replacing the levels of understanding. But again, the pyramid remains, indicating 
that in our classroom experiences we still give that you know extra time or more time is spent on the lower order thinking skills and less time on those higher order thinking skills of analysis evaluating and creating now uh, looking at blooms in experiment form what actually happens is uh, the 1956 model and the 2001 model if i ask you to design a course based on what we have discussed on blooms if i say that you are uh, you know you need to design a course uh, based on what we have just discussed uh, let us take you know any other subject suppose you are you know from management and you want to decide a design a course on uh, business analytics if i say that the curriculum uh, the the university curriculum or your you know or institutional curriculum is not that upgraded and you want your students to understand business analytics and you are told to design a course on business analytics what comes to your mind first i'm sure what comes to your mind is what are the topics that i need to cover in you know this uh, um, course of business analytics that I'm preparing. So you discuss and you know you try to think about topics, the broad topics, the specific topics, the interrelated topics, uh, the subtopics that you need to uh, incorporate into your course. And basically, it's a hierarchy of topics, so to say. So from the broadest framework of topics, you come down to the narrowest of topics and you formulate a syllabus or a curriculum and basically once all those topics are written you are convinced that if the student uh, you know goes through this business analytics course he or she will have an understanding of business analytics is so this approach of course design which is based on working upon or thinking or specifying a hierarchy of topics is as per what we discussed right now the traditional pyramid approach of blooms where we find that you know that uh, higher order thinking skills there is that narrow peak which gives you very less time and opportunity in your classroom experience to uh, take your students uh, to those higher levels of understanding so what happens uh, is that when you think of topics you think that my student does not know business analytics right now. So my student is an empty vessel. And, you know, by the topics that I have just framed in my syllabus of business analytics, I will pour those topics. Uh, and, you know, my student will be filled with knowledge of business analytics. So that is traditionally what happens. And uh, happens you know, more often than not. So this is the scenario that we observe, even if we use blooms as it stands. So after this, the story progresses further. You know, you have uh, the topics, your empty vessels, you are pouring that knowledge into those empty vessels. So you are doing your bit right. Knowledge is being transferred. But what happens is, your student is faced with a very big question, where to use the knowledge. One answer is exam. The other answer is certification. But then there are no further answers. So this is the gap or this is the trap that all of us, both the teachers and the students are confronted with when we use blooms even when we use blooms, so to say, even when we use blooms in its original framework, this is the gap that all of us, you know, uh, find. So uh, what happens is uh, the exam pitfall, which I say that, you know, you uh, explained the topic, uh, explained everything in the course of business analytics, you provided them all the notes, you gave them all the study material, lectures were very, very clearly done. You thought you have been very, very clear to them. You have explained them whatever was there in the syllabus. You have provided them with all the resources and study material. But when you set up an assignment or a test, very often you find that you will say that the students have not done well. Or if they have done well, they have not done as per your expectations. 
So this is what happens is that the experience in the classroom is limited only to these lower order skills as we just discussed, lower order thinking skills. And when the student is given an exam or you give an assignment, the student is expected to move up to those levels of analyzing, evaluating, and creating. And that is why there is this pitfall in which both the teacher and the student are trapped. Because in our classroom experiences, according to the pyramid, we did not give that uh, required time or opportunity for our students to analyze, evaluate, and create. And believe me, the best of teachers you know, experience this pitfall. And uh, we find that there is this gap where we are not able to fit into our classroom experiences, uh, ways in which we can make our students analyze, ways and means in which we can make our students evaluate, and ways and means in which we can make our students create that new body of knowledge or something new that we are trying based on what we made them to remember and understand or apply. So this is the usual uh, scenario that one experiences when uh, one uses blooms, when one uses blooms in the traditional framework. And uh, uh, if I were to go a little you know, into practical uh, implementation of uh, all these frameworks, we find that uh, more often than not, these frameworks are not implemented in most institutions. What we are looking at right now is a scenario where even after implementation of these uh, frameworks, this is the pitfall that we experience. So is this a, is, isn't this an indication that we need to revisit blooms we need to uh, you know, change the lens with which we view blooms, or we need to change the glasses that we are using to view blooms and use it as a teaching framework or a heuristic to plan our classroom experiences. So uh, let us see how we can you know, use a different lens to look at blooms. So this is what is actually, you know, uh, the really upgraded version of what Blooms is, or to fill that gap that you experience along with your students. Uh, as as I as I mentioned that you know exam pitfall is a 99% uh, experience scenario. 99% of students and teachers do experience the exam pitfall where you have you know the teacher thinks that they were very very clear in class. They gave all the notes, uh, all the study material was provided. And when there is time to, you know, attempt the exam and the results come, or you give an assignment and you evaluate the assignment, you just don't find what you expect, what you expected. And this is precisely because in the framework of Blooms, both in the 1956 framework and in the 2001 framework, you find that Pyramid gives you very less time and opportunity include those higher order skills in your classroom experiences. You do not let your student or there is very, very less opportunity and time given for the student to be able to analyze, evaluate, and create. So let us now revisit Blooms and look at Blooms in this wedge model, which is you know a totally looking at Blooms uh, through a different lens, so to say. So when we look at blooms through this lens, what happens is that we are no longer looking at blooms as a pyramid where there is that narrow peak for high order skills. What we are looking at is a wedge in terms of blooms. And we find that you know we are giving that broad base, knowledge is important, you know, giving that uh, resources, the basic fundamental and foundational fundamental principles to your students is important. So you have the broad base of remember and understand. And then you give that required time and opportunity in this wedge with not that narrow peak indicating very less time. You give them the opportunity and the time to analyze, evaluate, and create. So what happens is that when we use Blooms as a framework in its wedge model, as we can see right now, we no longer limit ourselves 
or our classroom experiences in ways where we are only able to achieve the first three levels of blooms and we experience the exam pit fall. We are giving our students the opportunity in terms of planning our classroom experiences in ways that we give them certain assignments or certain tasks or ways in which they are able to analyze. We give them those opportunities. We give them those you know, multiple means of expression where they can express what they have gained in these three levels. So it is basically wedge framework of blooms when used as a heuristic that gives you uh, that uh, different view of your classroom experience where you can make your student travel that distance from merely limiting to lower order thinking skills and moving up to those higher order thinking skills. So this journey that we often miss, this journey that we often miss from traveling from lower order to higher order thinking skills, actually the vehicle to this uh, road is the wedge model. So in our classroom experiences as teachers, we need to make that conscious effort that we are putting assignments or you know whatever means of expression or active learning techniques are such where my student is forced to evaluate, my student is forced to analyze, or my student is forced to synthesize the fundamental knowledge that has been given so that I'm able to create along with my students something new that we have been uh, looking at just uh, not understanding or just not knowing what I know. My student should definitely be a better version of me. If my student is like me, then you know uh, the teacher is the teacher's job is not done. So when I aim at my student being the better version of me, it is this wedge model which helps both the teacher and the student travel their journey from lower order thinking skill to higher order thinking skill and achieve uh, that the framework of analyzing, evaluating, creating, and building or threading those activities into your classroom experiences so that your student is a better version of uh, you. So I hope that uh, you know the wedge model that we have just discussed of blooms helps uh, as teachers uh, since you know teachers uh, all of you are from uh, different disciplines so i cannot be very very specific or, or i cannot give you concrete you know evidences because you know for teachers teaching say mathematics it will be different for teachers teaching language it will be different for teachers uh, teaching say economics or accounting it will be different management different so that is very very discipline specific so uh, it is for us to identify our disciplinary teaching approach and then use this match model as a framework to make our student the better version that we think uh, of uh, that we are. So basically, the wedge levels of understanding and the 2001 Anderson and Crothwell model which was the action verb integrated model and this is what we are seeing as the revised wedge model where we find that this blooms is no longer viewed as a pyramid the way we look at blooms is now changing to a wedge where you give your students that broad base of knowledge, but you also give your students that extra time and opportunity to cover those higher order thinking skills to be able to be better versions of you know who you are as a teacher. So this is how uh, you know blooms is a very very beautifully uh, crafted framework which has evolved, particularly in the digital era. Uh, in the digital era as teachers of you know, hybrid uh, classroom setups, we have that extra edge where we can give our students those enrichment activities, those online uh, assignments where they are able to you know, uh, go through resources, search material, 
and able to analyze and evaluate. So the revised model of Blooms is a perfect uh, fit in the digital era of uh, classroom that we are into right now. And if this is used as a framework, believe me, your classroom experiences will be very, very different. And uh, so to say, the next step that we have been talking about, outcome-based education. So this is the first step. Once we are clear with you know how Blooms has evolved and how in the present era we need to revisit Blooms and if, if fit a framework uh, as uh, the requirement of the digital era, we will be able to make those classroom experiences which are very, very outcome-based. And once the student has an outcome clear for the class he or she is taking, their engagement and their attention in the classroom will no longer be a challenge. It will be something very, very natural as we started. So it is uh, you know, a circle. You start from natural, you move to blooms, revisit blooms, and then when there is a classroom experience, you come back to that thing happening naturally. There is no extra effort that we need to put. So this is how blooms as a framework can help you. Now, based on what we have discussed, uh, you know, in terms of uh, evolution of blooms, so stay, say from step one to uh, wedge, uh, if now I ask you to design that uh, course of business analytics that we just spoke about, if now I ask you to design that course of business analytics, then your first thought will be not the topics. You will no longer think of what topics need to be covered in uh, business analytics, but you will be thinking of once my student achieve, uh, enrolls into this course of business analytics, when the student exits the course, what do I want that my student to learn? What do I want that my student you know, should have that uh, concrete or tangible uh, learning uh, evidence. So your first question will be, what are my students going to learn from this course that I am planning of business analytics? Next, after learning, what are the ways in which this knowledge of business analytics can be applied by my students? And when you sought answers to these two questions in that process of seeking answers to these two questions, you will be able to build through your course, those topics, those classroom experiences, those assignments, and you will be able to design a course which is outcome-based and uh, the student is able to uh, find that satisfying and value-added learning experience. Value-added learning experience is something which holds uh, the key for, a, for any uh, course to be really uh, successful. So it is basically how I find answers to these questions myself as a teacher or as a planner of a course that uh, the course that I evolve or the course that I build, you will find that most students will be attracted to those courses where these outcomes are very, very clearly defined. So this is how uh, Blooms as a framework or Blooms as a heuristic can be used for, uh, for uh, you know, uh, taking that leap, taking that leap in terms of being very, very objective and outcome based in your uh, teaching. So uh, if you have any observations on, uh, you know, what Blooms, uh, we just discussed on blooms. I will be happy to take them before we move ahead if time permits. So if you have any observations that you would like to make uh, about what we have just discussed. Okay. So let us uh, in the next, um, and there are 10 more minutes left. Just, just yes, a time. No? Yes, Ten more minutes left. Yes, ma'am. You can take your time, ma'am. No issues, ma'am. Okay. Okay. So, uh, moving from blooms, uh, I would like to draw your attention to uh, backward design, which is uh, which is a framework of. outcome-based 
education. So once you know we have that understanding, that fundamental understanding of Bloom's uh, outcome-based education, uh, you know, comes uh, comes to be the next stage or comes to be the next question. So in outcome-based education, backward design as a model is uh, something very very useful. And here, as we say, that we plan not what we are going to teach in class first. So backward design primarily focuses on firstly identifying the desired result that you want in your course. So you have those broad goals for your course. Uh, for instance, I'm taking a, a course of biotech, bio, say biotechnology and I want that my students are able to distinguish between whether a process is scientific or whether it is scientifically weak. So that is my broad goal that I want, that once my student completes my course of biotechnology, I want that he or she should be able to have that understanding to distinguish between a strongly crafted uh, you know, scientific understanding or a weakly drafted uh, scientific understanding. So based on that, I will design my experiments. Second, I will see what are the evidences that I'm going to take in terms of evaluation. Evaluation is not just, you know, taking tests or giving those assignments. Evaluation is much more. You can even give them a very, very simple task and ask them for peer assessment. So if their peers are assessing them well, you will take that as an evidence to see that your broad goals are met. So assignments or evaluation for that matter, accepting things as evidence that my goals are achieved is the second step in backward design. And what are the ways in which I'm going to plan, plan my learning experiences, my classroom experiences? How many lectures am I going to take? How many activities am I going to conduct? What are the things that you know will be given as home assignments? What are the things that will be given as enrichment activities or self-study activities? So that is step number three. So technically, backward design is a model of outcome-based learning, which moves from back to front. So you can say, when I, when I go to class normally, I say, what am I going to teach today? How am I going to teach today? So that comes in step number three in backward design. And after that, in a normal classroom scenario, I say, once I have taught, I'm going to take this test, I'm going to take this assignment. So that comes second. And then based on their test result, I say whether my student has done well or whether my student has not done well. But in backward design, we move from deciding the broad goals that you want your student to achieve first. They have to be very, very clear. Once your broad goals are clear, based on that, you decide what will be your evaluation parameters, and then you pl plan those classroom experiences. And then you will see that in the end, those classroom experiences will map perfectly. It will be like you know, uh, fitting something into the complete frame. Fitting something into the complete frame. Your classroom experiences will completely fit into the result that you want to see in your students. So outcome-based uh, backward design is a very, very powerful model when applied you know, with utmost care and precision. Outcome-based education uh, backward design model gives very, very good results. So basically, in the first stage, you want to know uh, what you want out of your students, what you want them to learn. And as we just discussed, that uh, you have those broad goals that you decide uh, what you want. And based on that, you plan your smaller objectives, like you plan your experiments. Uh, you know, how are you going to, uh, what are the hypotheses, supposing you are teaching in science? So you plan those smaller goals when you identify, uh, and then you connect it with the taxonomy, like we just did. So, what part of you know, your experiments will make your student analyze? What part of your experiments that you are doing will make your students simply understand? What part of your experiments will make your students simply remember? So that is how you use that taxonomy to connect with backward design. Then, And then you connect it to action verbs as we had done, that your experiments will help your student to list 
what are the steps in the experiment your student will be able to compare by doing the experiment so this is how we connect them uh, you know to taxonomies so in outcome based teaching you first uh, define the broad goals small objectives and then action verbs of what you are going to make your student uh, do in the stage 2 you will see what are the things that you will take as evidence what are the things that you will take as evidence that your student is learning so uh, assessment uh, uh, planning assessment planning as i just said that assessment can be self assessment also you can ask your students to maintain their own uh, you know uh, progression graph and identify their own strengths and weaknesses it could be peer assessment you will also take peer assessment as a parameter to know that your students are learning it could be process portfolio where you ask your students to document how they have you know journeyed from knowing only one concept to 10 concepts and so to say so it's a process portfolio and in some cases if the subject allows that is you know exhibitions of what students have learned so it has to be multiple ways in which you are uh, taking the assessment and very very important in assessment is uh, assignment design that I, i would like to draw your attention to it is very important that you know your assignment design is uh, clear uh, i would li like to just draw your attention to you know this rubric framework where uh, normally what happens is that we design an assignment and we give it to the students and when it comes back we on the flair on the spot decide oh i like this so i i'm giving 9 out of 10 i don't like this so i'm giving 6 out of 10 this is very very poor so i'm giving 4 out of 10 but have you ever thought that did you tell your students what is very poor for you what is poor for you what is satisfactory for you and very very good for you so when you are in the second step designing your evidences you need to clarify to your student what will be the frameworks that you will take as very poor poor satisfactory and very good so rubric uh, designing is a powerful tool uh, which is thread into backward design where prior to your assignment or along with the assignment you have this rubric framework given to your student so the student knows that if i have got uh, two mark uh, you know i have got two marks so this is a six mark rubric design that you can see why i am giving six to my student so this is why i have got a zero this is why i have got two this is why i have got four and this is why i have got six so a rubric framework helps your assignments to become more sharp and focused and that problem of you know uh, the student not being satisfied with why the teacher has given me you know something that i have got uh, the problem is uh, you know immediately resolved because the student can look at the rubric framework and see and assess for themselves why have they got the marks that they have and the third that we discussed in the backward design was planning those uh, experiences in the end now i am planning those experiences so in my classroom and when i am planning those classroom experiences uh, th those classroom experiences are you know primarily divided into four zones four time zones when you you know plan a classroom a classroom is designed or uh, divided into four zones the first is the moments before class where the bell has not rung and sometimes we happen to you know come into the class early so that is a very very crucial time that we need to focus upon the initial minutes of the lesson that means when you have introduced the topic and you you are just doing the introduction then the main part or the body of the lesson and the conclusion so when you are planning the third step in backward design that means your classroom experiences you need to find concrete uh, you know uh, answers to all these four moments of your classroom these four time zones so to say of your classroom the moments before your class starts there the initial minutes when your class has just begun and you are introducing your topic when your topic is taking shape and you are you know explaining what you want to and finally the conclusion so we'll quickly wrap up you know what is the best to do in terms of these four so these moments before class are often those unguarded minutes where you know the teacher uh, enters the class and uh, you know the students are just getting ready we have not officially uh, you know come to those uh, 
curriculum uh, or the topic that we need to discuss that it's the time that you need to establish the trapo with your students that can be done by simply asking them what is the news uh, what is the news of the campus or maybe you know your city or uh, what happened so that builds that rapport so those moments before class that we often undermine or you know we ignore are potentially the most valuable moments that the teacher has the most valuable moments that the teacher has so in those moments when you establish that rapport you hook the students you know uh, to you now whatever the teacher says the students will listen because with that stimulus the stimulus that we just discussed where you are asking your students what is happening or telling them something for that matter they have you know you have kind of hooked them so now when you move to the main part of your uh, lesson so this is the initial minutes of your lesson you you have them hooked already so they are with you and now they will you know be a part of what you are saying so moving to uh, you know the introduction introduction primarily should focus on recapping of what you have done or what is their previous state of knowledge introducing them firstly to the learning outcomes uh, gauging what they know previously and identify some you know misconceptions some topics have some misconceptions like this is very very tough or this is not that important or this is not that significant so identifying some commonly held you know misconceptions is something that you need to tackle in the introduction of your class the body of your class the meat of your class when you actually have the topic it is very important that you have answers to these questions sorted how should i explain this topic to my students which is most meaningful and what are the alternative ways in which you need to explain to your students how can you keep them actively engaged Uh, by giving them real life experience examples connecting them with analogs or stories or conceptualizing something for that matter and then how can you make that uh, student who is just you know uh, uh, who is nuanced to that topic how can you step forward your uh, topic to making that student you know traveling their journey from uh, a nuance to uh, an experienced uh, uh, understanding of that topic so that is precisely what the body of your lecture should assess and look at and finally the conclusion is when you conclude you should always ask the students what is the most important thing that they have learned today and also what questions remain to their mind before you actually conclude so this is a framework interweaved into backward design which helps uh, to manage the last uh, this thing of your uh, class so i hope that uh, what we have just discussed of uh, blooms about blooms and uh, you know backward design uh, helps us travel that first step of uh, outcome based education so i thank you for uh, you know listening patiently and if you have any questions or any observations i will be happy to take them The session is open for discussion now. You can unmute and interact with the resource person, or you can post your queries in the chat box. So, if you have any observations, any insights, any questions, suggestions, we can look at them. Okay, I see. It seems that you know um, there is nothing much that needs to be discussed. You can post your questions in the chat box also. I'll read it to Ma'am. ob attainment i understand you know uh, will be dealt with tomorrow uh, primarily this uh, you know this was as i could understand was uh, blooms ob and then attainment so uh, you have a two day time frame madam uh, or uh, lord immaculate i can see the message so attainment i uh, you know will be dealt with tomorrow 
so what i have just discussed this is where i'm leaving this will be continued tomorrow uh, from ob discussing more on ob and how attainment can be done so that i think will happen what k level for ug and pg k level i'm not able to understand knowledge level does that mean knowledge level for ug and pg is what the question means both same level of knowledge that you want your students to uh, go to depends upon you and uh, primarily in uh, the ug uh, courses we make the student analyze and so to say synthesize yes rightly we do take them to the higher levels in pg but then this is topic specific there are some topics you know which even a ug student can take up to the highest level of evaluating and then creating something new so this is completely uh, you know uh, the the levels of knowledge or the level of uh, understanding is subject specific and topic specific i as a teacher need to plan how far in my learning experience i want to take my student it can be a ug student or a pg student any more questions thank you thank you for those questions Okay, so uh, are there any other questions, ma'am? Um, no. K level in question pattern, ma'am. There is a question mark in the chat box, ma'am. K level in question pattern. Question pattern knowledge. That is what uh, we were just discussing. That when we are setting those exams, the knowledge level uh, in the question paper depends upon your classroom experience. If in your classroom you have made your student to analyze you have made your student to move up to that level only then will you be able to justify those questions in your question paper so very often this happens is that you know in our classroom experiences we address only the knowledge and the remember state and then in the question paper when questions are asked students often find that this is a level that is new to them an area which they have not traveled you know when we go to a new place or a new zone we feel kind of lost so similarly uh, as i said that there is no specific percentage that we can assign as a teacher i need to take control of my classroom experience uh, what i am offering to my students and based on that what i am you know setting in the question paper blueprint to all disciplines uh blueprint is what we just discussed like uh the uh, levels of understanding that extra time and opportunity that is missing right now is something standard for all disciplines but giving a, a blueprint to every discipline uh, is not a possibility because it is something very very discipline specific as i have been telling you that a particular topic if i plan as per you know uh, blooms and as per uh, outcome based education you will see that uh, the, it is completely independent there cannot be a structure or a frame that can be provided one teacher may be doing it differently the other teacher may be doing it differently depending upon even the student intake so depending upon what are the kind of students that you are getting that also makes you know that difference in how uh, we assess the levels of knowledge supposing you know for instance and i am teaching a management course for uh, them the levels of knowledge attaining the higher levels becomes easier and somebody in uh, in, a, in a rural background taking an mba course so uh, for them attaining those higher levels becomes challenging so it is you know a framework cannot be set 
for difficult chapters group discussion is effective or not uh, for difficult chapters group discussion is effective or not is actually uh, like uh, you need to first gauge the prior knowledge of your students what is their level of knowledge if they do not have any prior knowledge group discussion can you know further be detrimental because they don't have that fundamental or foundation so without foundation taking them rightly into a group discussion you know can uh, can be detrimental it can be harmful so for difficult chapters it is important that you know you provide them that knowledge base first because it is as it is difficult and if we miss that knowledge base then group discussion you know will uh, certainly not help the cause uh, madam uh, linda i hope that answers your question any other questions i think there are no more questions ma'am shall we wind up now yes ma'am yeah by the name i could judge for a ub program yes lord macleod yeah i was just trying to recollect the name but uh, good you told me so maybe you can unmute it will be good to hear okay sir ma'am i am lord the macleod i came to your college during uh, 2016 17 i hope so to attend the ub program uh, it is yeah. uh, very I useful can... for us for an fdp program ma'am Yeah. And that I, I, thing itself, itself, we learned the Google Classroom and everything. Okay, okay, okay. You came from uh, which, 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 which place, ma'am? American Chen College, Madurai, ma'am. Okay, American College. Okay, great. So there are a lot of people from American College. Okay. Yeah, ma'am. <laughs> I, 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 I believe we met also. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. We met. <laughs> so it's a small world, ma'am. So IOT Academy is making us meet again. Shall we wind up, ma'am? Yes, ma'am. On behalf of IIT, I thank Dr. Rohalini, ma'am, for the very informative and uh, interactive session, ma'am. And we thank you once again for the amazing you. presentation. Your tips and techniques on uh, blooms will be very fruitful and beneficial. And thank you for spending your valuable time with us, ma'am. And I thank all the participants for joining the session today. And uh, kindly fill the feedback form using the link that will be posted in the chat box. Thank you all. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all the best. Thank you, ma'am. This is not very informative. Kindly submit the feedback form using the link that has been posted in the chat box. Thank you all.